please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. All right. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for that panel. Lots of, lots of great uh, use of language there. Um, uh, pejoratively, I remi I'm reminded of a, a, a phrase that uh, my wife of 45 years and I have often, uh, which is, uh, uh, you say you're listening, but are you hearing what I'm saying? Um, uh, so um, uh, our next speaker who I'd like to introduce is one of those rare, uh, although we've got a lot of rarities in the room here today, one of those uh, incredibly successful and uh, uh, doctors uh, as a pediatric cardiologist in a major teaching hospital uh, in London, uh, who, uh, like a few of us, went to the dark side um, and became a leader. Um, uh, most of our colleagues call us administrators often when we go into uh, leadership and management positions, um, so we fight hard against that. Uh, but he became a leader uh, and he became the chief medical officer uh, within uh, this huge hospital system in London, uh, and then also then moved to Oxford, uh, where he looked uh, to uh, support change as the chief medical officer there. Um, he didn't stop there. He then went to become uh, the second uh, chief inspector of hospitals uh, across uh, the NHS in England. And as you know, we have one system uh, of delivery in England. We have an independent sector. Uh, but uh, the chief inspector of hospitals is the chief inspector of all hospitals across the whole country. Uh, so Ted took that role on. Um, during that time, uh, Jeremy Hunt, who was the Secretary of State at the time, uh, asked uh, us to look at how do we create a better environment and a better model for investigating when things have gone wrong. Uh, to our patients and their families and to the healthcare workers in, in said. And a few items have already been talked about, a uh, second victim, uh, disclosure of information. Um, and uh, one of the biggest elements that patients' feedback were getting was that the variability was terrible, was huge in terms of how investigations were taking place, uh, how their, clinic, their incidents were, being, were, were taking place. Uh, Investigations were taking too long um, and they weren't being involved. Patients were not being involved in the way uh, that investigations took place. So our next speaker, Ted Baker, I'd like to introduce you now, is the new chair of uh, the Healthcare Safe Safety Ser Services Safety Investigation Body in the UK, which is a first uh, globally. Um, our colleagues in Norway have legislation for it, but this is a uh, a first system approach to doing this. So I'd like you to introduce to Ted, who will take us through that journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Ted Baker. Uh, so um, thank you, Mike. Um, I have to say that I'm very lucky that Mike is not only a long term friend in the NHS in England, but is also on the board of the Health Services Safety Investigation Body and he, his contribution to it has been major. So I'd like to thank him for that. And the award he received last night was very well deserved. I should congratulate him on that publicly. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry I'm not lunch, um, but I, I will try and be brief so that y your appetites have been whetted by the mention of lunch. Uh, and I will try and get you to it as quickly as possible. Uh, in fact, that last session I thought was really, really good. And, uh, uh, and s as so many of the sessions in this Congress have been really exciting. Uh, dealing with patient safety is sometimes daunting. We, we saw that with uh, uh, Dr. Berwick uh, yesterday. We've seen that in the patient stories we've seen videos of. Uh, patient safety uh, puts a lot of, produces a lot of concerns. But equally, I'm, I'm an optimist, like several others have said they're optimists. I think we're at a turning point for patient safety. I think there's a real opportunity that we can make a real difference to patient safety over the next few years. The, what I've heard here in this, in this room has really, uh, if you like, uh, enhanced that belief in me today. So, so, so thank you for all the work you're doing. I want to talk a bit about the work we're doing back in England about investigations. Uh, so can I have my slides, please? So let me take you back 10 years, 2014. 
at that stage, and, and, and uh, Dr. Durkin was, was talking about this uh, a few minutes ago, uh, we recognised we were not learning when things went wrong effectively. We needed a better system of investigating when things go wrong. And this paper was published in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine. It's by uh, Carl McRae and Charles Vincent, two patient safety experts. And they said, if you're going to learn effectively when things go wrong in healthcare, you have to have a much better way of investigating, uh, investigating uh, what's gone wrong. And they said this needs to be an independent investigation and it needs to be expert investigation. Too many investigations are run by frontline staff who do not have expertise in safety science. They don't understand how to do a really good quality investigation. They challenged the English NHS to find a different and better way of investigating uh, healthcare incidents. Now, this, we are very fortunate because this was taken up by the House of Commons in London. Uh, and the Public uh, Administration Committee of the House of Commons did this report in 2015. It's a very good report if you have the chance to read it. But it, sa it, it said that we needed a new permanent independent body to take dispassionate system-wide view of safety. It was a body that would have safe space for disclosure. And that comes back to what we were hearing just a few minutes ago from the previous panel. It would, it would, it would be given legal immunity for, what it, for its investigations. And it would be a, a repository of good investigative practice and demonstrate that best practice uh, so that we would lead in terms of improving investigations across the board. And finally, it would not apportion blame or liability. Now, this was a very bold statement by politicians. This was a bipartisan committee. They spoke to aviation experts. They spoke to experts in other fields of safety, uh, in safety critical industries. And they said, this is what we need in healthcare. Uh, so they recommended that we set up this body. Uh, legislation was necessary. And legislation, as you all know, takes a long time to deliver. So it wasn't until 2022 when the Healthcare Act, this Portmanteau Act was delivered in 2022, which set up the new body, which I now chair. In the interim, uh, a, a non-independent body started doing the work. And so in safety investigations started moving forward. So we were able to take over a process that was already underway. The Health Services Safety Investigation Body was established as independent of government. And its role is to investigate in incidents that occur in England during the provision of health services that have or may have implications for the safety of patients. So harm does not need to have occurred for us to investigate. If we believe there's a chance of harm, we can investigate that. And I think that is really very important because we don't want to be a service that first, that, that, that first does harm before it learns. We want to do no harm and learn before, before harm occurs. Its purpose is to identify risks and to address those risks by facilitating improvement, by making recommendations to the systems and practices of healthcare. And we finally became an established legal entity on the 1st of October, 2023. So we are 11 months old. So we're still new kids on the block. So what do we do? What does the Health Service Safety Investigation Body do? It promotes healthcare safety excellence and learning through investigation. We do investigations. Through education, we have a very strong educational arm, uh, training uh, 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 healthcare staff in investigation across England and collaboration. And we've heard several times already during this, uh, uh, this conference about the importance of collaboration in patient safety. And we don't want to be a body that sits apart from the system. We want to be independent in what we do, but we want to be there, part of the system, encouraging change in culture and investigative practice. We do independent safety investigations. We don't apportion blame or liability. And we focus on the system. We don't focus on the local factors. We focus on the system factors. And one of the things we're keen to do is professionalise the patient safety investigator role. And that's part of our education arm to make sure that the best possible investigations are done across the whole system. What's different about what we do? Well, as I said, we don't apportion blame criminal or civil liability, both in our reports, but also in our messaging. So we have to be very careful about the language we use in the reports, but also when we're talking publicly about our work. We are not there to find who is to blame when things go wrong. We're, we're there to find out how, what is there to learn to improve the system and make, make patients safety. We never identify individuals. 
or the organisations we're working with, uh, uh, they can provide evidence to us in total confidence they will, that their names will not come into the public domain. Information we hold is legally protected. It cannot be uh, 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 accessed by any legal route. It is protected from a disclosure. And we do not disclose any of that evidence part of the investigation or even incidents we consider considering investigating are not disclosed in public. And our reports, when they come out, cannot be used in any legal proceedings. So our reports cannot be taken and used in a court or regulatory proceedings in any way at all. When we investigate, we, sorry, we, we also have new legal powers uh, and these legal powers will uh, enable us to compel any individual to attend an interview or provide relevant information to us. They enable us to enter or inspect any premises in England and we can seize information, documents, IT, IT, uh, information from IT systems or equipment if we need this as evidence for our investigations. And failure to comply with any of this uh, uh, with the instructions of investigator or, de or instru uh, delivering uh, misleading information is an offence. What do we investigate? Well, we're independent of what we investigate. It's up to us what we investigate. We can only investigate a few incidents every year, so we have to choose very carefully what we investigate. We don't want to repeat or supersede local investigations. We want to support the system in focusing on the main safety risks. So we look for safety incidents that have widespread implications uh, where our approach can add value to the system as a whole. So we want to understand major themes in influencing safety. For instance, the management of safety, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Fatigue, we're looking at fatigue in, uh, as a factor in safety. We look at mental health care. We're looking at the justice system and, and, uh, and health care in the, in the justice system. We've published only two days ago a report on temporary staffing and the implications of safety of temporary staffing and the need to involve temporary staff in, in, in safety investigations. And we've also published work on the safety risk of information technology. So what do we do? We focus on system improvement, not on human error. We have a mantra that human error is a symptom of a, of a safety issue. It is not the cause of a safety issue. We want to understand the reasons why the system allowed the human error to occur. We don't want to identify the human error and make that the, the focus of our concern. We involve its safety investigators from a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, we have uh, people from safety critical industries, we have people from aviation, nuclear, we have policemen uh, 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 amongst, our, amongst our inspectors. We have some clinicians, but clinicians with a strong background in safety science. We are multidisciplinary in our approach. We involve the, uh, uh, a wide group of people. We bring in subject matter experts when necessary, but most importantly, we always involve patients and patients' families in the investigation process. We heard how important that was a few minutes ago in the session that's just taken place. But what I want to emphasize is we find that patients often have a unique insights into the safety issues. They have a unique perspective on safety issues. They see safety in its reality, not as how we imagine it to be. And how we, how, how we provide care, we often imagine we provide care in a way that is not experienced by patients. So the patient's insight into safety incidents is really very important and is central to our investigations. We make recommendations to reduce the risk of, uh, of harm, working with the system to implement those recommendations. And we try and be transparent, transparent and collaborative in everything we do, but we maintain and protect that safe space I was talking about so that people can feel confident in talking to us openly and honestly about safety incidents they've been involved in. So, so far, uh, 11 months in, we've published 12 investigation reports making 32 safety recommendations and 27 safety observations. We've launched a further 14 investigations uh, and you'll find details of all these on our website that I've highlighted there. Here are some of the investigation reports we've published. I won't go through them in detail, there isn't time for that, but just that top one, ambulatory infusion pumps. When we're sitting here yesterday, hearing about the uh, uh, alarm fatigue from the charity in Berlin. I was thinking about that investigation because that investigation was all about alarm fatigue 
and the failure of infusion pumps to, to raise, raise concerns effectively because the alarms were going off too frequently. And we, part of our recommendations for that was, was alarm systems in infusion pumps need to be redesigned. And work is going on about that in the UK and I hope internationally from, uh, at the moment. But can I just highlight two uh, investigations reports we've done recently? One is on patient misidentification, where we uh, identified that misidentif if, if, misidentification of patients during handovers between different providers is much more common than people realise. Uh, and we identified that the, the, the problems with this is that, that people assume it is a simple process to ensure the, the identification of patients, and they don't look at the system factors that can go wrong. We asked for more research into what happens when patients are transferred between providers to make sure that their identity is secure. We asked for more regulatory focus on that handover process to make sure that the regulator is looking at, uh, at the approach to uh, uh, identification during handover. And we are, have recommended they should be moved towards a standardised approach to scanning patients for patient identification across the whole of the NHS in England. So once you're positively identified in one part of the NHS, that identif identification carries with you through the system to, make, to, to, to try and remove the risk of, of misidentification. The second one there, retained surgical swabs, is, is, is a report we published earlier on this year. And this was about a 51-year-old lady who had heart surgery. She had, she, after surgery, she wasn't recovering well. She had problems with chest infections. X-rays showed retained swabs. She went back to theatre. They found the retained swab after a very difficult procedure. Uh, she continued to have problems. Uh, there was still another swab that, that they put inside her. She had to go back a second time for retained swabs. So this poor lady had a dreadful uh, experience and there were real problems identified. What we looked at was the process for identifying where swabs were missing and the reconciliation of swabs at the end of an operation. And we found that had been designed without any human factors input, without, without any a sense of the um, user focus of that and the environment in which, in which, in which, in which people were working. We recommended that the process should be redesigned using the best human factors and safety science. And we recommended that there should be more research into, into the technologies that could help support the uh, correct uh, uh, reconciliation of swabs after the operation. So an important one, a, a, one that, a report that focuses on human factors. And finally, my final slide, we made a major recommendations when the uh, 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 organisation was set up about safety management systems. We emphasised that healthcare is complex. We heard that earlier on in the previous session. And there is an assumption that that complexity, the safety in that complex service can be managed easily. And there is a, there's a lack of humility. We will not learn from other health, health industries, uh, sorry, other safety critical industries, where safety management systems have made dramatic improvements in the way safety is managed over the last 20 years. The time, this is now the time for healthcare to catch up. And if we are going to improve safety, introducing a better way of managing safety on a day-to-day -day basis, built on a really strong patient safety culture, is absolutely essential. That's my last slide. Thank you very much, everyone. If do, do go to our website. Do go to our website and read up some more of the investigations we've done. Thank you.